Hello, everyone. This is John Allen. I'm a senior product manager here at NICE High Security, and with me today is Daniel Butler. Daniel is our head trainer and is going to be uh, presenting today to you. We're going to take a deep look at the Strongarm M30 and M50 products and how to use them, how to install them. And uh, Daniel, uh, turn this meeting over to you. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Good day, everyone. All right. A nice high security uh, mixed gate operators for these uh, four different market channels, residential, commercial, industrial. And today we're talking about the hostile vehicle mitigation or collectively what we might call our crash products. And just an overview here of types of crash rated barriers. Uh, I'll go from left to right here. You see uh, on the left is what's called a, a wedge or a pop-up wedge. The thing about wedges, they're very uh, fast on an emergency deploy. It can really stop a vehicle. So if you have a final denial type of product, a wedge works really well for that. Uh, the next one over is I move to the right. That's a portable uh, modular wedge. Uh, we do not make a portable monitor. Some companies do uh, for ad hoc events, things like that. Uh, you can set up a wedge pretty quickly and have crash protection. So that's uh, the portable modular. Moving across is the what we call the barrier arm or barrier arm on, on steroids, if you will, or a drop beam. Moving further along is, is the bollards here. And active passive. Active uh, bollard is one that goes up and down. Passive is one that's permanently in the up position and it can be removed, obviously, but uh, but it doesn't go up and down. Uh, moving across is the Global Grabs net barrier, which uh, I think it's rated for uh, M50 status. And uh, yeah, the, the thing about the, the grab system is it's it's not a it's a non-lethal barrier that it doesn't destroy the vehicle or or passengers in the vehicle. It just grabs them and stops them, if you will. So, and then next to that is the uh, crash-rated slide gate. We make very good slide gate operators and a lot of our operators are put on crash gates. Uh, different companies make different types of sliding cr crash gates. And then as we move along there, there's the Jersey barriers and this dates way back to uh, back to the 1950s, right? And uh, I've seen these on different installations, military installations use these a lot to set up like a serpentine entry, entryway. So it slows down the traffic and things of that nature. So those are the Jersey barriers. And of all those barrier types, we, we make uh, uh, currently make two. We, we we have a third one in the in the hopper today, and it's going to be uh, released soon. But uh, currently, we make two types: a drop beam or a, a barrier arm anti ram vehicle uh, operators, and one is called the Strong Arm M30. We released this back in 2011, and the other one is the M50. So, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain the M30 and M50 as we talk about our ratings coming up. But uh, uh, a year later, after the M30 was released, we released the strong arm M50. Uh, so the previous one, M30, is to stop a, a medium-sized vehicle going at 30 miles per hour. And the M50 is a medium-sized vehicle moving at 50 miles per hour. Daniel, that's a good-looking gate there, it's, it, but it's white. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, John, that's because we offer these in custom colors. We, the the standard. If if you bought the standard option, it comes with a, a hot tip galvanized. But then we have one called a signal yellow that we stock as well, and that's a custom color. But then we'll we can paint it any color that you want if you give us what's called an RAL number, and that that identifies the exact color. And it, it takes a little longer because we have to go down and have those custom painted, but but we can make them any color you want, John. So that's why this one here is, is in a nice white and uh, I've seen some nice colors out there that, that would match the facility, so. Okay. All right, so, so that's the M50. Thank you, John, for asking that. And, uh, and now here, here we have a wedge. It's called the Hydro Wedge SM50. As I mentioned earlier, uh, wedges are, are great for final denial because if I hit the emergency fast close button or fast open button in this case, uh, the wedge would pop up and, and actually close. I have to think just the opposite on wedges. Uh, but uh, in a little over a second, that thing is deployed. And in the Hydro Wedge SM50, most of this presentation is going to be about, about the strong arm M30 M50. But the Hydro Wedge M SM50 is a shallow mount wedge only going down one foot and uh, deploying in, in, in less than a, a little over a second. And it's passed all three of the crash rating standards, the US standard, the UK standard, and the international standard. And it's the only machine that I'm aware of that's been tested for all three and with zero vehicle penetration. 
That means when, when, when a vehicle hits the barrier, it stops it dead in its tracks. It doesn't penetrate past that barrier at all in this case. All right, so and we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. So what do we, how do we see the typical applications? Where do we see these things being installed? Uh, uh, initially, we saw more of what we call the critical infrastructure, key asset type of sites or facilities. And, and so, you know, nuclear power plants, uh, wastewater and wastewater treatment facilities, uh, new, uh, hydroelectric, uh, US military installations, and obviously things like all the ports, the airports, seaports. And, and today, what I see in growing business today and over the past few years has been data centers. So we see a lot of, of our hostile vehicle mitigation or crash products being installed at data centers. Public government buildings, secure corporate facilities. So, so what, what I'm seeing is the hardening is being pushed further, further out in, in essence that, uh, for example, one of our customers had an executive parking lot that they wanted to protect a little harden the security on that. So they use crash barriers for that. So we're seeing more of that happen out there. So let's take a quick, uh, we're going to talk about the crash rated crash ratings themselves right now. And here's a little timeline. So I think I mentioned pre previously the, the New Jersey wall, which I guess could be maybe one of the first crash barriers, a, a passable one in, in, in that case, but that goes back to 1950. And then as we move up the timeline, uh, State Department and uh, DOD came out with their own standards and that involved and that was in 1985 where they came out with what was called the K rating system and the K rating system has been used up until about 2003 uh, and most recently until maybe about uh, 2007 when ASTM came out with their own crash ratings but but they they use uh, what they call the K rating system K for kinetic energy and, and so it was similar to today's ASTM in the sense that uh, as we were looking at hostile vehicle mitigation, we were looking at medium-sized trucks, that there was three speeds that they looked at, uh, a medium-sized truck, uh, which they defined as 15,000 pounds. And if it was moving at 30, 40, or 50 miles per hour, that would be a, 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 a K rating for that. So K4 for the 30, K8 for the 40, and K12 for the 50 miles per hour. And then they added to that how far it penetrated the barrier. And so that came out in about 2003. I think that was DOD came out with the, the penetration standards that they call the L rating, okay? And, and so if it penetrated up to a meter, a meter to seven meters, uh, so how far? So that, that's in combination with, did it pass the rating? First of all, did it stop the vehicle? And then how far did it penetrate the vehicle? All right, so that was in 2003. 2005 and 2006, you, you'll see uh, the past 68 and 69, those are the UK standards, uh, PAS, public available specifications, and they're real similar, even though obviously they use uh, the, the, the key difference you'll, you'll notice is metric versus US uh, measurements, right? So kilograms and uh, kilometers versus pounds and feet, things of that nature, okay? So that's the past 68 and the past 69 for the UK. 2007 was the first a ASTM F2656, and that's the standard that we crashed the, the strong arm M30 and M52 back in 2011 and 2012. And it was actually the ASTM F2656-07. That suffix on the end, the dash 07 indicates the year that they, so 20, uh, uh, 2007 in this case. I, th I think the current one for ASTM F2656 might be dash 18 at this point, but. Don't so that's, that's the spec that introduced the M ratings, right? Exactly, yes, John. And we'll talk about a little bit more about the M ratings. So yeah change from the K ratings to the M ratings. And with the K rating, use the L for penetration, the M ratings and M for medium sized truck, uh, use P for penetration, which is a better fit actually in some ways. So. And then the last standard, the, the International Workshop Agreement, IWA 14-1, that's the international standard by the ISO. So I think going forward, uh, so, so if, if you want to use your product in, in the UK, you'd have to conform to the past 68 or 69. In the US, it's the ASTM uh, F2656. Uh, uh, the global standard, which it'd be nice if we could test it to one and everyone would, would go with that one, would be the IWA standard, 14-1. So let's take a little bit closer look. Here, here's one of, uh, here's the K ratings, okay? And like I said, K4 is 30 miles per hour, K8, 40, and K12 is 50. They're all using a 15,000 pound truck at this point. And uh, for the US, that's a US style vehicle as well, because you'll see different types of trucks as we look at more of the, 
uh, the past 68 and 69 standards, okay? And, and there you, you can see the, the penetration, they use the, the letter L to, uh, for, so L3 is less than three feet, L2 is three feet to 20 feet, and L1 is 20 feet to 50 feet. And my apologies here, I should have actually put on those in meters. So, so that L3 is, is up to a meter basically, and, a, and then a, uh, I think it's a meter to about uh, seven meters on the next one. And, and then the last right in the L1, 20 to 50 feet. Yeah. So in, in certain lists for the State Department and uh, DOD, DOS, uh, that, that you had to uh, have only to be on their list, you had to penetrate less than a meter, which would make it an L3. So, so if you had a, tr a, 30, a, a truck that was uh, 15,000 pounds moving at 30 miles per hour, the, the, the rating of K4 L3 would be the one that you would be looking for to get on their their standards list okay and now we're here, here's the one that's looking at ASTM F2656 okay and on, on the side to the left here we're talking the C stands for small car small passenger car PF is PU is for a pickup truck M is what we're, we're, we're testing to which is the medium size uh, truck uh, at 15,000 pounds but a heavy duty truck 65,000 pounds there's a test for that but uh, we're not testing that, and all the other crash barrier manufacturers are testing to the to to, to the M rating, not to the H ratings. And, and here's the penetration. Here they're using P. So again, less than up to a meter or less than a meter. That that would put that there. Uh, let me see. And then the the next one is going to be three three point. Uh, let me see. One meter, seven meters, and then seven meters to thirty meters for a P three. And God forbid you got a P4 that's greater than 30 meters. That's that thing is running wild. So, uh, so Daniel, so, you said that our wedge had zero penetration, maybe even negative penetration. What rating would that get? Uh, it, it would, I guess, it would be P1 less than you know, a meter, right? You know, it's it's uh, even the negative is less than a meter. So, so I would think it would be a P1 rating. Uh, okay. So the the example they give, they say a C30. A P2 barrier will stop a, a, a small passenger vehicle uh, defined as 24 or 30 pounds, right? And traveling at 30 miles per hour. And it stops it between 3.3 uh, feet and 23 feet. So that gave it a, a C30 P2. In the case of our strong arm M30, that gave, it's a medium size. So we got an M30 and it stopped in less than a meter. So it's an M30 P1. In, in the case of our strong arm M50, uh, that would be an M50 rating for uh, 50 miles per hour. Uh, we, we, we crashed that and it, it was slightly over a meter. It was like 1.2 meters. So that gave us a P2 rating on that. So, all right. And here we're talking about, about past 68 and past 69. Uh, that here's their, their weight standards. And again, in kilograms, right? One and a half, uh, uh, 1.5 K. So 1500 kilograms. And as we're looking down into about the 7.5, a kilogram and 30k kilograms that's the ones we're, we're talking about today and they're moving here 48 kilometers if you take any of these and times six that would give you about 30 miles per hour and so 30 40 and 50 miles per hour equivalent they also talk about the angle the impact angle uh 90 degrees or 45 degrees and there's also a standard that says the debris field how far the debris scattered in that case uh, as, well, as well as the penetration, excuse me, I skipped over the penetration, but so penetration and debris field are two, two other methods. That so I believe the past 68, rather than having penetration ratings, they just state the actual penetration. Is that correct? Yes, I heard that too. That's why it says distance there. And, and I've heard that ASTM uh, was considering that too. Someone had told me that they, they were looking at that as well, because, you know, uh, the, the difference, if, if you, let's say, like in the case of our M50, where we, we did it slightly over a meter, it gave it a P2 rating, but the P2 rating is from three to seven meters. That's quite, quite a, 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 you know, a range there. And, and uh, how meaningful was that? Uh, I, I think it would, probably would have been better to just have the distance. And here's the IWA standard as well, uh, the International Workshop Agreement. And again, they're, they're, they're the metric uh, measurements. And on the right, you can see what they define as their, their type of trucks, okay? Uh, when we go down and we crash our, our uh, crash in uh, a truck into our product, we pick the type of truck, but, but there, uh, there's a certain standard of trucks that they use here in the U.S., and they're different in the, in the, U, in the U.K. and in Europe. And you can see here they have more bobnose trucks, so, so they'll, they'll say 7,200 kilogram and N3C. 
So that's the type of truck. So it clearly defines it in the weight of that as well. And again, they have the impact angles uh, of when the, the truck strikes the barrier or, or the, the wedge plate or whatever is being tested at that point. So now what is the difference between a test? Why do we test uh, versus engineering? And uh, I'll, I'll talk about our M30 and M50 products, the strong arm M30, M50. We tested, first of all, we, we make those in, in, in lengths from 12 to 24 feet. And, and we, we, we tested the, uh, the 12 foot because typically most, most manufacturers are, are only t uh, testing one. And so we chose to test that. But then we could test, because it's available from 12 foot up to 24 foot, we then engineer uh, test the, the other measured operators. And, and, and let me explain that. So, so an engineer will, will use something like a finite element analysis program and it'll put in the model of our product and all the forces on it and they'll test the different forces on that. And, and they'll say, oh, it should be able to withstand this or get this type of rating. And, and we've had them do that, but you really don't know until you actually set it up and you crash it. And then it looks like that picture on the right, right? Where, where it shows that, oh yeah, it hit that thing. And, and even though we thought it would get this type of rating and stop at this point, wow, that is sometimes we're surprised at, 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 at the results of that. So engineering versus tested, the, the tested is the, the real way to know how it's gonna perform in a real world situation. But uh, uh, again, manufacturers will, will test so many because first of all, these tests are very expensive too. And they, they, they don't need to test every product, but they test, test a range, okay? So. We use uh, third parties for, for both types of um, ratings, right? We, we use an independent um, test agency to do our crash tests for us. They, you know, they set it up and do all the measurements and do all the analysis and write a certified report stating the results of the crash test. And then we use um, third party engineers to do the engineered ratings. So they look over the analysis, do their own calculations, do their own estimates and sign off on the design for the rating for other arm lengths. Exactly, John. I, I think the only thing I correct you, and when Carco does it, they don't set it up for us. We do set it up ourselves, but they do all the measurements and they do the actual test themselves, yes. And they, they and let me switch that. So here, here's a list of those uh, you know, barrier crash test facilities. And the one that John is talking about, Carco up in the upper left, we use Carco because they're here on the West Coast. They're, uh, in the high desert close to Edwards Air Force Base out there, uh, a little bit north of Los Angeles. And, and so I think that's the closest one to us. And uh, all the tests that we've done have been down there at uh, Carco. And when you crash test it, it generates uh, a huge report because a, a lot of measurements go into this and a lot of measuring of the, the different forces. And there's also some high-speed cameras. There's a lot of capturing of, uh, of the video itself. And, and then they send you a one-page affidavit, which we have that we can give the customers. But we can also give you, if you need more of that information, we can give you summaries on that, the full test itself, okay? But this is typically what we hand out to customers to show that, yes, with a strong arm M30, uh, it was crashed at this, th this facility at this date and time, and this is the rating, M30 P1. And same on the right is the strong arm M50, and it was uh, the same thing, and it was an M50, but P2 rating. So recently, I, I hear more on the total cost of ownership. On, on, uh, and especially as I train maintenance crews out there, uh, they are really keen in, in, in preferring, uh, obviously, because they're having to do the work, uh, things with, with the less maintenance. And, and sometimes when, when we talk about above or below ground solutions, uh, maintenance guys, uh, they, they, they when they look at uh, below ground solutions, they, 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 they look at that as more work because places for, let's say you, you have a wedge or something where, where it, it's, it's a great place for water and debris to collect. So, so they're, they're having to do more maintenance for that and, and, and more of your operational components might be exposed to, to more weather and corrosion and, and things of that nature. So uh, above ground is good. Uh, it, it says on below rounds, you can have deeper foundations for uh, better penetration protection. I'm sure that's true, but keep in mind, we, we make a wedge that's only a foot deep and, and that holds up uh, pretty well. It's passed all three of those tests. So I, I, I think even with that shallow mount, it, it, it can really stop some uh, hostile vehicle mitigation there.
And here, here's the strong I'm here. We're going to talk a little bit what we call the value proposition or the unique selling proposition, USP. Uh, so what are the, the, the highlights that make this product uh, the, what we call the best of breed? Okay. And, and first of all, as it sits here with all these, uh, the, the traffic light, that, that white little shield on the right, on, we, we call this where the traffic light is, we call this the pivot post or the hinge post. And on the other end is the, the, the catch post, the receiver post. And on that, you can see this big white shield here. We call that an entrapment shield. That's really for safety to keep, uh, because that arm is closing, that arm is heavy. We don't want people over in that area and getting hit by the arm. And, and so we do a lot for safety. Uh, in the world of gate operators, there's, there's a standard for safety called UL325. And, and for these type of products, hostile vehicle mitigation products, they do not have to comply to UL325. But even with that in mind, we want it to be as safe as possible for people traversing the barrier, security personnel. So we put a lot of safety features on there. I already mentioned that entrapment shield, and that's why we put on this high visibility LED lighting so that arm is really visible. And, and even with this red and white standard striping on there, okay, it's reflective and it's really visible. Uh, we put in a monitored photo eye. It's integrated into it, okay, comes with the machine. Uh, the traffic lights, is the, the signal, when to go, when to stop, all that is, is part of that. There's even a little white shield here on, on the hinge post, uh, uh, excuse me, pivot post, that, that uh, to keep people out of there as the arm opens up, okay? And, and so those are a lot of safety features. There, there's two other features that are huge for this. One is the one on the live, it says all machinery is self-contained and above grade for reliable performance. When they were designing this, the original design was to take, on, on the pivot post, it, it houses all the electronics and the hydraulic components, all right? Originally, both of those, the electronics and the hydraulic, were gonna put, be put into a separate cabinet and remote it away. So you'd, you'd mount that at one spot and then you'd run the hydraulic lines over to the, M, the operator itself, the M30 or M50. Uh, they changed it at the last minute thinking that it would simplify the installation and it does by, by putting these components within the, the pivot post itself, right? So now I don't have to trench and, and run hydraulic lines, it's all self-contained. And by the way, in case I didn't mention this earlier, these are hydraulic based operators, okay? Uh, we feel hydraulic is a very strong and powerful and reliable uh, way of powering our operators, and these are hydraulic-based operators. Uh, so so uh, I mentioned the self-contained cabinet. The other thing that, that really is unique about this is the dual arm design. Uh, when we were designing this, initially it was a single upper arm, but, but then just like uh, the ideas about uh, putting all the controls within the pivot post, we thought, well, most of the, the strikes on this arm uh, are going to be accidental. And as of today, I don't think we've ever had a real terrorist strike on one of our strong arm M30 or M50. So, but we've had a number of accidental, you know, whether a, a delivery truck uh, didn't see the arm, whatever. And, and we've had others where, where people just weren't paying attention. And we felt that uh, from the ground uh, up to that, the, the center of that uh, upper arm is 34 inches. And most passenger vehicles, if they struck that, would slide underneath it. And we thought that that shear off the top and caused serious injuries to someone who made a mistake. And so uh, we were trying to be a little bit more for forgiving to them for that. So we put on that lower arm. Uh, uh, both the upper and lower arm are aluminum extrusions and the real strength of those arms is, is the material. There, there's a fabric material inside of there that is really adds strength to that arm. But the lower arm is really, uh, critical in, in not causing damage to, to a, a passenger owned vehicle that's, that accidentally hits the arm, okay? So. Monitored photo eye, it will also help with, with some of that too, but it's more for pedestrians, okay? All right, so as we were, here's a, just a, an overview of the M30, M50. Uh, again, we already mentioned crash tested the ASTM F2656-07. That was the standard at the time that we tested it. Uh, M30, P1. M50 P2 or equivalent to a K4 L3 or a K12 L2. And, and uh, let me see, we've already talked about most of this here, but, uh, and, and we'll, we'll show you a hot, uh, another slide coming up, but there's three ways of mounting this uh, M30. There's a, a standard mount, a deep mount, and a shallow mount, and we'll take a closer look at that coming up. When we say on the bullet down there that says 12 to 24 foot clear opening, two foot increments, we don't really say 12 to 24 foot barrier arm length because we're, we're not really concerned with that 
the length of the barrier arm in essence, because what is more important to us is that if a vehicle is passing through this barrier, that the arm is out of the way so that if, let's say it's a 12 foot clear open, that, that if, the, if the vehicle is you know, up to 12 feet wide, it's gonna go through that opening without any, hitting any components of the, the, the operator itself. And because the, the, the hydraulic cylinder that, that powers this arm is a special cylinder with a special encoder on there, and it's always powering the arm, we can put that arm at 90 degrees and that way a, a, a large vehicle, uh, delivery vehicle won't clip the arm. So that's why we talk about 12, 12 foot clear openings, not arm length, okay? It takes about six to eight seconds to open and close that arm, six for the shorter 12 uh, cl foot clear opening, eight for the 24 foot, and we can shave a second off if we do an emergency fast close. So uh, in an emergency fast close, basically you have a button that someone's gonna press and hold. It's not just a single, it's a press and hold. Because when, when, we, when we're trying to close that gate because we see some threat coming, it's going to ignore any safety device that's holding that gate open. So if there's a loop underneath the, uh, what's called a vehicle induction loop underneath it, uh, it's going to ignore that loop and close the arm. If, if, if there's a photo eye or anything, it's going to ignore those safety devices because you're seeing a threat and you don't want anything to impede or, or keep that arm from closing. So it ignores all those and it closes. So, so by setting that on, you, you can get it to close a second quicker, right? If you really want the fast deploy, I think the wedge is probably your best for that, but uh, uh, the M30 and M50 work well too. Last thing, 100 cycles per hour. We're talking about throughput. How, ma how many pa uh, vehicles can pass through this and inspect it and that, that arm is opening and closing. We can do, uh, initially out of the gate, we said we can do 100 cycles per hour. Uh, we had a customer request a higher, uh, performance, uh, actually 150, 200 cycles per hour. Uh, we didn't think that was doable if you're, if you're really inspecting vehicles, but, but it was all about cooling the hydraulics. And we did that by increasing the hydraulic hose size and putting some blowers on that. And so that, that gave us the ability to do 150 to 200 cycles per hour. I think we might have covered all this, but just, oh yeah, most of the features on the left we've covered. Hot dip galvanized coating, that's the standard. 100 cycles per hour, but I just mentioned you can, if you, if you want more throughput through that, you can put on what we call the extreme cycle option. And as you see on the right here under options, the, the extreme cycle gives 150 to 200 cycles per hour, right? Uh, one traffic light comes with it. You can order more traffic lights. There's four mount points on the pivot and catch post for putting on traffic lights. If you're using it for bi-directional traffic, obviously you're gonna want at least two traffic lights on there, right? Uh, on the options, we say CE models available. CE is for uh, the certification so that we, these, these units can be sold over in, in Europe. And so we did pass the CE certification. So those are available uh, for, for uh, selling these over in Europe. Uh, I've already mentioned this, the signal yellow powder coat finish. That's one that we stock. That, and that, that's not quite a custom color because we, we stock that and a lot of people go with the signal yellow. It's a, it's a very striking color, right? And, uh, but the, the standard, as I mentioned earlier, is the hot dip galvanized, but the standard yellow is also one that we stock and you can get pretty quickly, but you can get also any color. It just gives us an RAL code. We now I've seen them in, in like green, uh, some very nice green ones. I've seen some really uh, nice looking red ones. Yeah, so, yeah. I saw one that they did for uh, one of the uh, intelligence agencies that was black and had some purple in it. It was a really cool look about it, John. So, <laughs> yeah, really nice. So, and then because we, we, we install these throughout the latitudes and, and longitudes, actually throughout the world, we're installing these now. And so we put heaters on. So there's a heater for the, the pivot post and, and, it's, and it's primarily to, to heat the hydraulics. And, and then we also have a heater for the catch post. To hopefully, like if there's snow kind of building up in there, and that, that'll melt some of that to keep that from freezing to the catch boats, right? And because these are, I mentioned it earlier, these are hydraulic gate operators, and when that arm is down in the closed position, it's hydraulically locked. But uh, if you want additional security for, for locking, we have a mag lock you can get on there that's gonna, uh, we, we, we put the strike on, on the arm itself, and then it comes down and, and, and connects to the the, the maglock unit itself, so for extra added security. And, and also, we also have where you can put a pin in, in, in on the end on the, uh, where the arm closes on the catch jaws and there's holes in there where I can put a pin and actually padlock the arm in the closed position. 
I can also open it and there's the same holes where I can put a pin if it's, if it's in the up position too. So just security, right? Additional traffic lights, I already mentioned that, but uh, yeah, you can get up, to, uh, up, mount up to four, but typically only two is most places it's, it's unidirectional, not bi-directional, so it's usually one. And for some of those who, let's say they have out in the, uh, a lot of airports might have a, a, a gate that they only open for uh, every now and then for a maintenance thing and they, and they don't have power out there. So we do offer what we call the NP version, the non-powered model. It's really identical other than there, if you looked in the electrical cabinet side, there, there's, there's nothing but a, a ground lug in there. And on the, the hydraulic side, we've replaced that AC or DC motor that, that would drive the, the simple gear pump in the hydraulic system. We've replaced that with, with a, a gear box that, with a hand crank on it. And it takes about uh, a couple minutes to crank it up. And then, and you could put a drill on there. It, it's meant to put a, a high speed drill so you could use a, a high speed drill if you wanted to. But we've been timing this and as you crank it, uh, about two minutes it takes to, to open that. And then to close it, there's a little valve that you just turn and it just uh, gravity feeds it, closes it down. So works well. And by the way, we, we have these to where uh, they, they can be field upgraded. Uh, uh, so, so if you run in that situation where you had one where you, you installed one of these and you thought you were only going to use it rarely, but it turns out that you're using more than rarely that, and you decide to put power out there, you can upgrade these in the field. We've actually had that done. So. And, and here's an example here. Now going back, we, we talked about that upper and lower arm. And here's an example that happened uh, not too long ago in Oklahoma, where the, the photo on the right shows this, uh, the arrow, the direction of the, uh, the vehicle was driving, coming down the street, and then struck this, uh, uh, the M50 barrier. You can see it right here. And you can see that that upper arm looks pretty much untouched. There's a few dings on the upper arm. But look at that lower arm, and especially that upper picture, you can see how, you can see the shape of the front end of that car bending out that arm. The, the person wasn't, wasn't hurt, had a few, uh, I, I think, uh, scratches and bruises, but nothing serious on this. So it, it really proved the point of the, of, of for safety, not hurting someone on, on an ac accidentally running into our barrier. And, and I've mentioned, we, we're, this is a hydraulic machine. And here we're showing the side of the cabinet on the pivot post that contains what we call the pump pack. The pump pack, it's a, first of all, we, we, here on the top of the pump pack, it, that's, a, that's a motor. On the M30, M50, that's going to be an AC motor, two horsepower motor that's, that's been uh, driven by what we call a VFD, variable frequency drive. So it's a high speed, allows smooth operation and very low wear because uh, it's a three-phase motor, right? It is a double acting cylinder inside the cylinder that opens that, that arm, this, the, the upper and lower arm. The lower arm, by the way, just follows that upper arm. It's linked to it. And, and inside that cylinder is also a special encoder. It, it adds a little bit of cost to that cylinder, but we also know that, that it, it gives us a lot more uh, motion control. And we always know where that arm is at. So even, like I mentioned this earlier, that uh, we want that arm to open at 90 degrees. We make a, some other barrier arms that we call the strong arm, not the strong arm crash or strong arm M30 or M50. But when you install those, they do not have this uh, special encoder double acting cylinder. Uh, and so when you open the arm in the vertical position, it doesn't go to 90 degrees, it goes about 87, 85, 87 degrees. And when they close it, it's a little gravity assist that it, it comes down with. In the case of the strong arm M30 or M50, we're always powering that arm. And when it's open, it goes full 90 degrees. And when we close it, we actually uh, accelerate that arm to close it. So it gives a little faster close on that. All right. Daniel, why does that one have a hand pump on it? Oh yeah, well, John, that's, thank you, John. I forgot to mention that. That's, that's important because uh, this is a powered operator, which means AC power, right? Uh, but we make operators that have DC power too, but in this case, this is an AC powered machine. What if you lose AC power and you need to open and close it? Or, or if you just didn't have power and you needed to open and close it, you're setting it up or working on it, there's, there always has to be a way to open it manually. And that, the picture on the right, where it's showing the pump pack here, there's that AC motor on top of the pump pack. And if you look at the pump pack, there's a, uh, the gray, uh, reservoir or sealant can, if you will, with the yellow label that holds the hydraulic fluid. Just to the right of that is the manual hand pump. So the inside of the cabinet, there's that, the, the handle itself, you put that in there and you pump it and that'll open and close the arm. There is a little valve here that you have to swap 
uh, pull out because it's what we call the directional valve. So when you pump it, uh, the thing will close and then to open it, you, you pull out a valve. And it's really easy to use. So that's the manual. You have to pump it both up and down, right? Exactly, John. Yeah. And thank you for asking that, John. And, and this is, uh, I, you know, we, we do have a manual pump on, let me go back a couple slides here to that MP version, right? This is different than that, okay? Because that's a special gearbox that's on top of that one there. And it and actually cranks in a circular fashion, whereas the standard manual pump, th th this is not circular, it just goes up and down and you're pumping it, you know, up and down. And, and I know on about a 12, 14 foot clear open, that'll take you about 45 to 50 pumps. So just to let you know it's so. But it gets the job done. It's a smart touch control board for Legacy high security, high security, uh, the nice company bought high security back in 2016. And up to that point, the high security product line, we had a line of high security hydraulic operators and the high security uh, electromechanical operators. In, in, in both of those lines, the hydraulic line and the electromechanical, each of them had a, a, a main circuit board and they all used the same main circuit board. So in all of our hydraulic gate operators and the strong arm M30, M50 being a hydraulic gate operator, they use what we call the smart touch controller board. And the smart touch control board is a combination actually of the, the smart touch controller, the, the main circuit board that you see here, and, and then also the keypad display because that's how you interact with the board. Okay? And, and the board was developed back in the early 2000s and, and it's on its second version of that board, which came out in 2006. But well, for a board to last, you know, 20 years, that's pretty amazing. So this is the main circuit board in our hydraulic machines. It's microprocessor based, which means it's controlled by software, which means that if we want to either add some new feature or function, or to, uh, I, I guess even if we had a, a bug that to fix, it, it's doable because we, 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 we fix it in the software and we update it with software. So uh, it was like when back in 2016, when we had to come out with supporting uh, the monitored, monitored entrapment devices for UL325, it was an easy change for that because it was a software change. We, we just had to do the software, not a hardware change. So part of the smart touch control board, we have three onboard usable user relays. We have dozens of preset configurations for all those user relays. We have something called RS45, which is a, uh, industrial communication standard and that's how we do certain applications such as dual gate uh, we have it says precision motor control we do that with a, not only the controls on the smart touch controller board or that in combination with that special cylinder we have and then uh, and th then you can manage and configure all this all from that keypad display right here and this this the keypad by the way is what we call a dual function keypad in, in the sense that in, in one mode or what we call the command or operate mode you're gonna press the open, I don't know if you can see it on this, because it's kind of small, but you press the open button, open the, the gate operator, close to close it, and stop to stop it and reset it. But once you press the menu key down here, then those, those, those key, key buttons had a different function and, and it, to, it was to work with the menu selection. So previous, next, and select, okay? And, and once you got this down, it's a piece of cake to work with and change the settings on this. We, we do have a, a special Windows-based application that comes as part of the system. So it, it's, it's gratis, it, it's part, part of the smart touch controller system. And we run it on a Windows based PC and it allows us to not only uh, update the software, but do the, the menu settings and it, be able to save those settings and, 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 and restore them if we need to. And maybe one of the most important things is on this main circuit board that we call the smart touch controller, we store 320 of the last events or, or entries events that have happened on, on, on the gate operator. So you can view those with that, uh, with the START software, we call it START, S-T-A-R-T, Smart Touch Archi Archive and Retrieval Program. We, we, we've given the capability of, of viewing the log on the display too, but, but the, the best way to view the log is with, with a PC and using the START software program. The last thing on this, we talk about the HY-5B advanced vehicle detectors uh, for, People who have been with us a, a while, we, we had the HY5A vehicle detectors. And, and within the last two years, we've updated those to the HY5B. Uh, these are all auto sensitivity, uh, auto uh, gate compensation. There, there's a lots of really cool technologies in this uh, too. So it makes it easy to set up. And because it's, it's talking, there's an affinity to, for these um, uh, 
vehicle detectors to talk to the microprocessor on the smart touch controller board. Uh, it automatically assigns the frequencies. And so there's absolutely no crosstalk. These are very good, uh, robust vehicle detectors. And uh, John, I know, was uh, in the develop, uh, did a lot of development with uh, uh, one of our partners on developing these new HY5B vehicle detectors. John, would you like to add anything under these? Or uh, I would just say that I think they're the, the most sophisticated and capable uh, vehicle detectors on the market. They uh, communicate directly with the smart um, touch controller over um, over the communication bus on the board, which gives us the capability to do some really cool things with it. But that's a subject of another webinar. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. So now most places, well, not most places, many of the, the more uh, high availability high availability hardened sites might already have auxiliary power because uh, they don't want the they, they they realize that when you power the power outage your stuff isn't working so they always want it to be able to work but if they don't have auxiliary power we sell a ups or what we do, a battery backup system it's called the high inverter ac okay and so if you need battery backup for the m30 or m50 this is the unit you want uh we're gonna let's open up that cover and let's take a closer look you can see uh, up at the top, this big black unit, it, it, it has the inverter uh, charger unit, okay? So, so typically when you have AC power, it, you would connect to this box and it would just pass through and go to the M30 or M50 and, and, it, and it's just a pass through. So while it's passing through, uh, this inverter charger is trickle charging those batteries. We've got four 110 amp hour batteries in here. Uh, we we put the uh, a pair in series, another pair in series, then we put them in, then we parallel those two pairs, so we get uh, uh, 200, 220 amp hours and 24 volt DC right out of these 12 volt DC batteries. Uh, if if uh, it senses of uh, AC power loss or what we call shore power loss within 120 of a second, it'll start inverting the DC from those batteries to AC. And you probably won't even notice that it's now running on DC or the battery backup unit versus uh, the, the AC power. Okay. Uh, there's also a display that gives you status because it's talking directly via, via the Modbus to our gate operator itself. And, and that gives you a lot of good information on that. Very heavy unit. The you know, batteries are heavy. Oh, oh, forgot to mention too. On the batteries, temperature control. They're sitting on shelves. Uh, on the shelf, we have silicon heaters. And, and then we have a blower up here, an exhaust fan, and we had thir two thermostats. So when it drops down in the lower uh, 30s and 40s, we turn on the heating elements. And if it gets to 90 and 100, we turn on the blower. So we're trying to maintain the environment uh, because the hard thing on batteries is extreme hot and cold, right? So uh, that's the UPS, Universal Power Supply, or battery backup option for the strong arm M30, M50. And now we have a few site photos here. Uh, picture time. It's uh, the, it, the one you're seeing right here is actually our first install. It was down in Deer Park, Texas, petrochemical. You can see even that arm, it looks like a barber pole or a candy cane at that point. They hadn't standardized on the, uh, the MUTCD, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. They have a standard on striping and, and that's the one we're using today, the red and white triangles. So. Oh, and by the way, excuse me, that is a galvanized one there. So that's the gal hot dip galvanized standard. And that's the M30. Here's another. And this is the signal yellow. I mentioned that, that we, we stocked this one as well. A little bit uh, additional cost above the galvanized, but, but less than the custom color cost. Right? Is, is that the standard um, reflective tape on there? On oh, this one, it is. Yes. This one has the standard. It's a... Uh, as I mentioned, there's that manual of uniform traffic control devices, and they give standards for this, you know, for the yield signs, and all those those traffic signs, and and 16 inch rectangles of red and white, so 16 inches of both. So, oh, and by the way, uh, let me let me so see that. Yeah, we're showing these gate operators. Uh, typical in, on an installation, we'd want them down on road grade, not up on the curb, but it worked in this way too. It's, and I'll show you, here's one, uh, well, here's a couple here. Here's one installed at the uh, courthouse in Oklahoma. Uh, in, in this tight confine here, it's a little bit of a challenge getting that arm installed, but, but you, uh, it's a little bit of a puzzle. On the right are some up in Canada, and you can see how they've 
uh, notched into the the curb here right this is the way we want them we want those things uh, at the road grade here if you do that uh, i see a little water pooling here you you want to crown that little pad so water moves away from your operators but uh, uh and these are m50 oh here's an m30 over here the the m50 looks really pretty close, but you can see it's got these buttresses coming kind of here. So the footprint of the M50 for the pivot post and the catch post are identical, about a two, two by three feet. Uh, on the, the M30, the catch post is, is significantly smaller than, than the pivot post. So it's one way you're telling them apart. Here's one, this is the at and This is the one of the parking lots in here. Uh, that that this, is, this ramp goes down in the parking lot. They did a a nice job on all the concrete work on here, as you can see, because uh, you had to shoehorn these things in there, and it's a nice, nice install. Well, we already saw that one on the previous one, but this is the Forensic Lab up in Toronto, Canada. Oh, one of the things here, they they chose not to put on the the, the entrapment shield. I think some of it would because the guards are in this booth. I think it was a visibility issue, but that is your option. We, we uh, the the entrapment shield comes standard with it. You know, if you if that's getting in the way, you don't have to put it on. Here's another one up in Canada as well, an M50. This is at a petrochemical in Utah. I think these are the ones that asked us for the 150 to 200 cycles per hour. And here's one at a major airport in uh, Virginia. They have a number of these. This is for all the, the vendors come in and they have to get, get, get inspected and make sure that they're allowed on the premises here. But you can see a number of these in front of all these uh, M30s sit lined up here are wedges. And the guard booth over underneath the, uh, the covering over here, that's where he has the emergency pass uh, close button. And if he pushes that, all the wedges pop, all the arms drop. And you can see over here, they've done good work here on the notching out into to putting it at road grade as well. You can see one of our slide drivers over here. And speaking of slide drivers, they this is the same airport. This is, uh, and you can see they, they have what's called a security gate and a traffic gate, the traffic gate being the, the strong arm. And we have a slide driver. That's a, a slide driver is our premium slide, uh, slide gate operator, uses a rail instead of a chain. But what we have here is because both of these have the same uh, main circuit board, the smart touch controller, and we have a way of combining two gate operators really easy in what we call dual gate systems. And, and the, the things we defined as dual gate systems, there's three of them. One would be a biparting gate. So let's say we had two slide or swing gates and they were biparting, right? They swung open together, right? So that, that, that's one. The second one would be what we call a sally port or interlock gates. And that would be uh, secure inspection areas that only one gate can open at a time. So one gate opens, vehicle passes through, the gate closes, it gets inspected, then the other gate opens to allow the vehicle to, to now pass through the barrier completely, right? And then that closes. So that's the second type. The third type is what we call sequence gates. And that's what you're saying, seeing here. And the sequence gate, the way this works is you have what we call the security gate that's, that, that's being driven, uh, operated by the slide driver. And then we have the traffic gate. And this, this one is a strong arm. This is the M50, as you can see. So the way this works is this vehicle came up and, and used this badge to open the gate that the, the first gate that started opening would be the slide gate because that's the slower of the two. And so it not, starts opening. And when it, as it approaches its open limit, it sends a signal over to the, to the, to the M50 here and says, open your arm. And so the, now the, the, the M50 starts opening. And so they'll, they'll probably be almost on their open limit at the same time. Okay? And then so now the vehicle can pass through and then the barrier arm would close and then the traffic gate or that side gate would close behind it. We call that sequence gate. All right, uh, here's a slide that, that's showing that uh, I'd mentioned that to get 150 to 200 cycles per hour, uh, we, we uh, cool the hydraulics. And here's a closer look at that. Uh, you can see hydraulic lines here. As a matter of fact, when we did this, we increased the size of the hydraulic lines on all the M30s and M50s because we thought they'd all benefit by having a little bit of uh, less cool, uh, uh, more cooling or less heat in the hydraulic system. And then, as you can see here, we added this special cover. It's got an active blower here, and it's got some passive vents here. So you're going to pull air in and blow it out, right? So that's the extreme cycle option. And now we, we're going to uh, show you a couple more um, optional accessories, if you will. And one of them is, is what we call the gigabit Ethernet switch, the HiNet, the HiNet gateway 
uh, SFP forward slash one is its actual official name here. And we use that for remote management, remote maintenance, remote diagnostics. So uh, what this allows you to do is put any of your uh, uh, gate operators on the TCP IP Ethernet network, right? So, you know, that's what all our computers are running on, right? So the guard shack already has uh, a network switch in there. And so if you can now put your gate operator on that, we, we also send some software that allows you to access it remotely, right? So you can uh, not only control it, but do you know, change settings, look at logs and things of that nature. So, so for re remote support, uh, the, this uh, HiNet gateway switch is, a, is an incredible device. It also lends its, itself if you have a more of a campus environment and you have a security management package that for, for managing all your security devices out there, this plugs into that. And we have uh, certain software that helps facilitate that, okay? And, and, and the software that comes with it, it's, it's like many of you have, or most of us these days have home networks and, and you have a little router there and the way you configure your router a lot of times, it could be with a wizard or they, they might give you an IP address and you point to that and it, it wakes up an embedded web server that's in the router, which allows you to configure it. That's the same way with the high net switch here. There's an embedded web server and it allows you to configure it with that. And, but but it, it's set up in a certain way and, and you could change the way that that's set up or functions. And the way you would do that, you'd have to customize it. But we have an API uh, application programming interface and it's called REST, R-E-S-T. It's a well-known uh, way for uh, programmers to set up uh, what they call REST services. It's more like a scripting language and allows you to quickly customize uh, the, the interface that we've uh, included with the HiNet uh, switch. All right, I think I've covered that pretty much. We're, we're gonna talk about HiNet and STC in a, in a subsequent session coming up, okay? And uh, I'm not sure that I mentioned it, but uh, let me, and we'll talk more about it in our next session, but on that main circuit board, the Smart Touch controller, there are three user-defined relays and relays are used to maybe turn on a, uh, an audible alarm, a, 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 a beacon, a, a light, or, or, or tell something to do something when this condition exists, okay? So we have three of those on board, but sometimes in maybe a more complex environment, you might need more than three relays. And if you do, that's what this is about. This is the high eight relay, and it gives you an additional eight relays, okay? So, uh, it's, which would mean that you would have, in, in this case of the smart touch controller, a total of 11 user relays. I would think that could do, you could get that to do just about anything you want at that point. Uh, and now we have a couple videos. Uh, we're going to take a look at the, the video for the M30 crash test back in 2011. This is a medium sized truck moving at 30 miles per hour, and it stopped it, as you can see, and the penetration. I don't know if you can see that. There's a stake here near that front top uh, wheel there, and, it, and it's that striped stake. That's the uh, that's the P1 uh, indicator right there. And where they measure is where the payload is at. So they measure it from this wall right behind the cab here. By the way, the truck has to weigh 15,000 pounds, so they're weighing the truck and they add sand in those barrels to make it 15,000 pounds. But the the penetration is measured from this. So let's watch that one more time. You can see that that behind the cab did not go fast enough. That's a P1 rating. Uh, and here is the M50. Uh, let me do that one again. You'll, you'll see that things went flying a lot further on that one. So the 20 miles per hour difference equates to three times the force. I have a chart that shows kinetic energy. It's three times almost exactly the, the force of that 20 mile per hour difference. So. And here's a slow motion. As you can see in this shot here, you see a number of cameras on uh, on tripods over here. Notice how that arm gets slices through the motor compartment. The motor should be dropping down. There's that P1 stake. And clearly did not exceed that, right? So uh, that's the M30 P1. So here, here's some foundation options with a strong arm M30. The, the one that was crash tested that you just saw that M30 was what we call the standard or tested foundation. And that's a six by six square, two feet deep, right? So, uh, so here on the catch post is a, is, a, is, a, is a pad that gets into the ground and here's the one for the pivot post. That, that's our standard, that's the one that was tested. But in areas like, uh, as I go further north in Chicago, Canada, where they have more frost line concerns, 
uh, they, they need to go further down. So, for, so there we have a deep foundation and that's a 444 cube. And so that'll put it deeper in the ground, obviously, right? And then for certain areas that maybe they don't want it to be even two feet because there's critical infrastructure pipes and things of that nature in the ground. So we do have a shallow uh, foundation. Notice too, the shallow is a monolithic. So it's all tied together. And the, the, the size of the shallow is gonna be six feet wide, one foot deep, and the length of it will be whatever the clear opening is of your gate operator plus eight feet. So let's say the clear opening was 12 feet. So 12 by eight is 20 feet. So for that one, it's six by one by 20 feet, monolithic. For the M50, there's only one foundation size. And that's, uh, again, a six by six square, same as the M30, but instead of two feet, that's four feet. So an additional two feet deeper. And for that one, that accommodates frost line considerations as well. So that's why we don't have a deeper one on that. And we haven't had a request for a shower one for, for the M50. Uh, John, have you heard anything about that? Or I, We get asked sometimes for um, different foundation designs and maybe there are underground uh, facilities that need to be avoided or the foundation of a building that's too close or something. We can help to identify engineering resources to redesign the foundation and come up with something that'll work. But the thing that you sacrifice with that is this, the crash certification. The crash certification only applies to the tested foundation design. So this is the design of the foundation that we tested. If, so if that crash certification, test certification is, is critical, then you have to use this design. And I, I put this slide in here just, say, just to show you that inside of those, uh, those blocks of concrete, is, is rebar, right? And, and, and for the number, for M30, it's a number five rebar, uh, number six, grade 60 for an M50. And, and this is a very busy slide. I just want to show you that we, we, we include this in, in the installation specification and documentation on how to do your rebar and the proper way to set it up. I always like to point out about the anchor cage and the template and the logistics sure. of the installation. Yeah, so let's talk about that. As one of our customers said, he thought it was the best installation technique he'd seen because the strong arm M30 and M50, these are the only products that re we require that you have factory training on. And th there's a pretty slick method in, in that uh, you, you excavate your holes, one for the pivot, one for the catch post. You, you do your rebar cages and you drop those in the holes. And then we have some plate and, and it's kind of a little cage that we drop inside of the rebar and it kind of floats in there. And at the top of this cage is a wooden template. And the wooden templates are the exact footprint of the M30 pivot and catch boats or the M50 pivot and catch boats, okay? They're wooden templates, they're the exact dimension. They're the same thickness and everything. And so when you put these on and then you center them in those holes, and then we have a little installation method where you use some uh, either two by fours or two by six and they're cut to certain specifications that'll keep these aligned perfectly and at the right height and everything. And so that once you pour the concrete, they, they get embedded, this anchor plate with the 10 anchor bolts are embedded in the rebar and concrete block. And on, at the top of that is the wooden template. And so now once your concrete dries or is it cured and you're ready to go, you, you've removed the, the, little, the wooden two by fours and two by sixes that have helped align this and then you, you remove the templates and, and the bolts are coming up into these wooden templates. You remove the nuts off, you pull the wooden template off, and now you, 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 you take your pivot and catch posts and put them right on those bolts, put the nuts on, torque them down to the, the torque specification, and they're, now you're ready. And it, it's really it's, that simple. Keeps everything aligned, right? So that, yeah, perfectly so that when you go to just bolt on the above ground stuff, the cages are already perfectly aligned. Exactly. And, and we have uh, in, in the class uh, in, for the strong arm M30 and M50, there's two manuals that come with it. One is installation instructions and one is the programming, programming and operations manual. In the installation instructions, it, it, it clearly lays this out. And, the, and when we have the class, the one day class, we actually have you lay it out uh, on, and, and measure it all out, get the cages in, in the right spot and, and show you how to do all that. And then once, then the second lab exercise is putting on the arms and getting it operational. So by the time you do the class, you should be pretty comfortable 
with installing this. And, and if you need some assistance, we have some programs too that we can come on, on site and assist with this. We ship this stuff in advance too, so that if you're doing your civil works before you need the, um, the actual machinery, we, we ship it out ahead of time so that you can have the site all prepped before the, the actual strong arm machinery arrives. Exactly, John. So we send the, the two wooden templates, one for the catch, one for the pivot. Each of the, the posts is going to have 10 anchor bolts each. So a total with their, or their spacers and, and, and nuts on there. So the 20 total and, and, uh, and then the anchor plate that sits at the bottom of these little cages. So two of those, one for each side. So yeah, that gets sent to you ahead of time so you can get your groundwork done. Once your groundwork is done and you're taking off the wooden templates, you know, we've set up a couple of these in, in a single day. They, they, they go pretty quick from there. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for, um, for taking us through all that. And um, I hope that this has been uh, informative to you out there about our products. And, you know, if you have any questions, uh, we'd love to talk to you about it. If you have an opportunity and you're not sure which is the right machine for you, or if you need help understanding how the foundation is going to fit with your access control point design, give us a call. We're happy to help you.